guests of the committee. I'm Peter Lindstrom. I will call the Environment Committee to order for June 27th, 2023. Got a great agenda before us today. Mm -hmm. uh, without objection, we can move forward with that agenda. And we've got some minutes to approve as well from June 13th. Is there a motion uh, to, to approve? A motion has been made second. and a second has been made as well. All in, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries. And that takes us to our first item, which is the consent agenda, which is the City of Independence 2040 Comp Comprehensive Sewer Plan Review File 22711-1. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay? Carries. And that takes us to our two uh, information items. First one is MOSAC and the TAC uh, update. And we have a few folks to bring us up to speed on what those two groups have been up to. Welcome. Thank you. Ms. Ross. Good afternoon. I haven't given a presentation in this room for quite a while, so I'm excited. We're not to be too here. scary. <laughs> <laughs> So good afternoon, uh, I'm Lanya Ross, and I'm an environmental analyst in the Water Resources Group in Environmental Services. And I am excited to talk to you today about two of our kind of core water supply advisory committees, the Metro Area Water Supply Advisory Committee, MOSAC, and their Technical Advisory Committee, TAC. And so as I get started, I just want to acknowledge that we have the chair of MOSAC on the Environment Committee, Wendy Wolf. So as I'm giving this presentation, if you want to highlight anything or um, call anything out, just let me know. I, all right. Um, so on the 21st at the Committee of the Whole, you heard about the update of the Water Resources Policy Plan. And uh, related to that is the Metro Area Water Supply Plan. And so this, this presentation is going to provide more information about MOSAC and TAC, who have a specific responsibility related to that water supply piece. And so um, I just wanted to give you a sense of who that committee is comprised of, uh, some of the work that they've done, and some of the work that they're going to be doing coming up, particularly as it relates to that water resource policy plan um, that we're working on, but the, the broader regional development guide as well. So um, I'm going to go over the connection between these committees and the water planning framework that you've seen, uh, what the committee's purpose and membership is. And I would like to spend a little time talking about some recent recommendations that MOSAC made to the council and then also to the legislature. So I think that's good information for you all to keep in mind. And then finally, some next steps. And I'm trying to keep myself to my script. but. If you have questions, please stop me and we can go where you need to go and what you're interested in. Um, I believe you saw this slide at the meeting of the Committee of the Whole on the 21st, but I do want to bring it back just to acknowledge that water supply has a kind of unique place in this planning framework. Uh, the Metro Area Water Supply Plan in particular, um, while it does have strong connections to the Water Resources Policy Plan, it is a statutorily required plan, and so it has some specific requirements of its own. Um, and it is intended to also support local plans and provide some local information and guidance. So um, I just want to acknowledge we have kind of this unique uh, space to fill. And that is really the focus of MOSAC and TAC in this planning framework. Uh, statutorily, the Met Council has some specific things uh, to do related to regional water supply planning. So I just brought, everybody's excited to read statute, I know, <laughs> but I think it's a nice <laughs> grounding piece. Um, Minnesota statutes do specifically direct the Council to do water supply planning, and it uh, specifically includes providing some technical information as a, a base for making sound water supply decisions, uh, making a variety of recommendations, including uh, recommendations around different uh, roles and responsibilities, uh, streamlining decision-making, um, funding, and there is also a requirement to develop a metro area water supply plan. 
And that plan has to be prepared in cooperation with and subject to the approval of the Metro Area Water Supply Advisory Committee, which is kind of an interesting, uh, they, they are the approving body for that plan, and then the council would adopt it. Um, and the council, in turn, has to consider, through this statute, the work and recommendations of MOSAC when it's preparing the regional development framework specifically. So this is a good time. We all have this good supportive framework to be working together. Um, and so just to kind of, there's a lot of moving parts in regional planning, and water supply planning is no exception. And so for the visual communicators in the group, this is helpful to me, just mm -hmm. highlighting how TAC is informing MOSAC. And then that information is going uh, to us here at the council, but also to the legislature. And so uh, this is a, a strong voice trying to coordinate water supply activities for our region. When it comes to water supply, I do think it's useful to really clarify the different roles. And so I've shared here the specific roles of the council, MOSAC, and TAC um, for water supply planning. And so, you know, at the council, there is the responsibility to plan for water supply, um, specifically developing and approving the regional development guide, developing and approving the water resources policy plan, but adopting the Metro Area Water Supply Plan at the recommendation of MOSAC. Um, and I do want to make, we, there's been some confusion with some of our local stakeholders from time to time about this, so I will just highlight that when we think about the council's role and planning and expectations for local plans, it is important for everybody to be aware that in regards to water supply, um, the Metropolitan Council is not a utility. We are not a water mm -hmm. supply utility. Uh, we are not a water supply regulator. So we are uh, very much sitting in the role of uh, planning and plan support technical assistance when it comes to water supply. And I think that can be confusing uh, for some because wastewater is a regional system and a utility. And so um, because at the local level, wastewater and water are very closely connected, um, that can be a little bit of confusion. So thank you for letting me stress that here. If you are out in your communities mm -hmm. and that question comes up, um, it is helpful to clarify that with people. MOSAC's role is to assist us, to assist the council in the planning. So they have been making recommendations on water supply related content for the regional development guide. The um, information has been part of the development of that regional vision, values, and goals. Uh, MOSAC is also involved in the development of water supply related content in the water resources policy plan. So the information and the recommendations they've made are shaping draft policy, for example. And they will approve the metro area water supply plan and recommend council adoption. TAC is informing MOSAC and it is uh, providing that technical perspective, making sure things are, are technically sound and feasible. Again, like MOSAC, helping to recommend regional development guide content, water resource policy plan content. Um, they don't have an approval role with the Metro Area Water Supply Plan, but they do make recommendations to MOSAC whether or not to approve that plan. So that's kind of the key players uh, in this planning process. Um, in case you want to know who the actual people are, we do have a list of the current members of MOSAC and TAC here, and you can see that they are representing um, a diverse range of organizations. Um, it's important there is requirements to have uh, representation from all of the counties across the region, uh, local all the way up to state level on MOSAC. TAC is required by statute to be primarily representatives of local water utilities, and so that has that very strong grounding in that uh, water technical perspective. And uh, there are some vacancies, so this list may change over time. We are working to fill those vacancies with the governor's office, um, and so stay tuned. <laughs> but this is a really unique pool of resources that the council has to draw on when we're wrestling with water supply planning. One of the um, resources that we can tap into and that they have created for us is a recent report 
to the council and to the legislature. It was uh, completed in 2022 and um, just a testament to the commitment of both of these committees meeting through the pandemic to develop this really robust uh, set of recommendations uh, regarding water supply. Um, it has been and it will continue to be an important resource that the council can tap as we do our planning and policy development. Again, it has been shared with council staff who are working on uh, the regional value, values and vision. Um, it's been shared with our policy writers. And so uh, this is something if you haven't had a chance to look at, I encourage, I did put a link to the full report in the slides. Uh, a summary, kind of higher level, more graphic summary is also available on MOSAC's website. So if you want just the snapshot that is available there too. I'm going to share a little bit of the highlights from that report because I think it's important for you as policymakers, leaders to keep in mind some of the priorities from this Water Supply Advisory Committee as we go about the plan update process. And so bear with me, but I think these are important messages and worth stressing. Um, MOSAC and TAC in their report did ask for um, council members, planners, legislators, community leaders to keep these points in mind. Um, funding is still needed, continues to be needed for public water suppliers and their partners' emergency responses. That's not a surprise, but that is a big challenge. We have a lot of examples of contamination and contamination response in our region. I would like to think that's not gonna happen again, but the reality is emergency preparedness is critical. Uh, communities across the region also need and are seeking funding for proactive infrastructure upgrades and expansion to improve our resiliency and our ability to withstand emergencies. Um, we also need funding in that area. Coordination across political boundaries is critical because water moves freely between communities and one community's water supply decisions will and have impacted another's. Uh, proposals for projects, for programs, um, have the most impact when they can advance multiple goals at once. Um, it's important, and uh, we've talked about this with our regional regional goals and visioning too, but recognizing that nexus between water quality, land use, groundwater, surface water interaction, and water supply infrastructure. So we have goals in these different areas, but they're all connected. And so um, when we can identify projects that can tackle multiple things at once, we all benefit. Uh, look for opportunities in your work where possible to remove regulatory barriers to help advance the goals for the region. Sometimes there are conflicting guidance or regulations out there. A stormwater reuse has been raised as an example of this. We wanna increase uh, stormwater infiltration in certain areas, but certain areas are vulnerable drinking water supply sources, and so we wanna make sure we're not putting contaminated water in the ground um, in certain areas, for example. Um, and then finally, um, as we go about water supply planning, as we think about policy or programs or projects, um, always look to request information from water utilities and resource managers to be sure that we're crafting the most effective legislation or other project scopes. So um, those were some uh, key messages that came out of that report. That report also um, articulated some goals, uh, kind of key areas. So I wanted to share those with you. And I think as this committee hears more about the policy research papers that are being done in ES, you'll definitely see some overlap and connections. Um, we had four goals in, yes, four goals in the original MOSAC report since then. Uh, we've been sharing that. Uh, the committees have had some suggestions to revise those goals. A fifth goal was added, um, but we're really focusing on water supply infrastructure, water quality, land use and water supply connections, um, understanding groundwater and surface water interactions, and prioritizing sustainable water quantity. And so they have articulated sort of what a goal or what success in the future under these areas would look like. And these are a, a really core piece of the update of the Metro Area Water Supply Plan that we're working on. This slide is illustrating the, the framework for action to achieve those goals. Um, and so including four general steps and related objectives under them, 
and they are discussed in, in more detail with a whole list of proposed actions in the full report. Um, one piece that I would like to highlight is that uh, there's no single effort, there's no silver bullet that we can do that's going to give us sustainable water supplies. Uh, there is a, it's a complex system, it's a big system. Um, so these recommended action steps uh, done together and phased in the right way are what's needed as a package to support better risk management across the region, um, particularly as we think about the full, I'm going to use the word right, water supply system in a more natural way, but when we think about water supply, you know, we're thinking everything from climate, the rain that is the ultimate supply, to the sources, the rivers and the aquifers uh, that we tap the infrastructure that we use to bring that to our users, the treatment that's needed, where we discharge it and treat it, and the environment that then becomes the source in the cycle again. And so um, there's a variety of actions and a variety of risks across that system that all come into play when we think about water supply planning. On here, there's one piece that I do want to highlight because it's kind of a core piece of the Metro Area Water Supply Plan update, and that was the recommendation um, on the far right under planning and implementation, there's a recommendation to establish a sub-regional planning approach. Um, I've been really talking about Metropolitan Council and kind of the region, but we've heard repeatedly that, you know, once, when, especially when it comes to water supply, one size does not fit all. The water supply <laughs> issues and sources and needs in one part of the region are not the same. So what Minneapolis is wrestling with with water supply is not the same as what Watertown is wrestling with with water supply. And so we need a planning process that respects that diversity. Um, and so leaning into that, uh, with that recommendation from Mossack and TAC, uh, Met Council has done sub-regional engagement across the region for years, but we're really um, tackling that in a much more strategic way this time around. And so, for example, in March of this year, we held a workshop for sub-regional water supply work groups and their partners to give them an update on the regional planning process and share this proposal for a sub-regional approach to water supply planning as part of the Metro Area Water Supply Plan. And so we asked for their reactions, their inputs, um, and their level of support for doing that. And we heard uh, strong support to continue that. And so we will be doing some engagement starting this summer, and that is something that you'll be hearing more about at a future meeting. Um, overall, in that March workshop, some of the topics that were raised uh, as challenges kind of across the region were, surprise, surprise, uh, money and <laughs> funding, um, conservation, challenges with growth, <coughs> climate, contamination, and, and growing challenges with workforce. So although those are regional challenges, what was interesting, I liked how this was articulated in the workshop, that the differences by subregion um, are really driven by the water resources differences. There are different aquifers available in different parts of the region, um, different water demands. And so although those topics are region-wide, how they uh, appear in different parts of the region, and the solutions to address them do differ by subregion. Um, and so this subregional approach and convening together was kind of reiterated with the group as a way to come up with a, a, a stronger, more supportable plan. So you will, we're trying to work to incorporate that. Yes, Wendy. Please, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to reiterate, in the previous plan, we had a hundred and some chapters of each city, this is how they do it, which didn't really accomplish anything. So having sub-regions where they can work together, since water does not respect <coughs> political boundaries, um, just makes more sense that they get a chance to craft their own solutions and work out their own differences and, and decide collectively as subregions what things are important to them rather than just adding a bunch of chapters that nobody ever looks at again for 10 years. 
Except you, probably. <laughs> <laughs> a few people have read the last play, <laughs> but yes. I think that um, recognizing, just to, to build on this too, recognizing that some of the solutions to these water supply challenges that our region is facing are too big for any one community. And so strengthening those partnerships is continuing to grow in importance. So. Which brings us to next steps. <laughs> um, this is a big effort and uh, the sub-regional engagement to scope out what a, a more localized plan, collaborative plan would be is, is a big lift, but um, we do have resources dedicated to that and we are planning to go about this process on the same timeline as the water resources policy plan. And so I think you've seen a version of this timeline before. The, the light blue and the green is the water resources policy timeline and the darker blue is the metro area water supply plan components of that. So it'll be kind of parallel effort. Uh, there's a lot of interaction back and forth between the engagement that we're doing for the water resources policy plan and the metro area water supply plan. Um, and so we have uh, multiple staff working on those together. Um, but the, some of the key uh, efforts to keep your eye on that we'll be bringing updates about would be the uh, sub-regional engagement. And we are also are looking for a committee uh, Mossack and TAC providing committee input into the water policy development that's going on. Um, also raising ideas for what water supply related projects the council could be supporting. Um, we do have an appropriation from the Clean Water Fund to direct towards water supply related work and so it, um, we work closely with our partners to scope out those projects. Um, and then ultimately this is all heading towards the development and approval of that metro area water supply plan as part of the water resources policy plan. So it's gonna be a very easy year. Mm -hmm. um, I have focused a lot about the metro area water supply plan um, and that is a core responsibility of MOSAC and TAC, but I do want to highlight um, how much MOSAC and TAC have influenced a very wide range of water supply related work that has been uh, done at the council since 2005 when MOSAC was convened. And so if you would like to see a really complete picture of the, the work and the influence that these committees have had over the years, I would encourage you to check out this 2020 report. Uh, it was the council's report to the legislature on um, how we are fulfilling that statutory responsibility. I and mean, it does lay out the history of the different projects, engagements, planning, legislative recommendations. And so I think that really gives you a sense of the scope of how this work has unfolded over the years. And with that, I would welcome any questions. Fantastic presentation, thank you. Any questions, please? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I was at the Northeast, North and East Groundwater Management Area meeting this morning um, with the four-year plan to deal with White Bear Lake and water supply up there. And it sounds like having the regional plans, the sub-regions is gonna be really important. So how, how do you envision incorporating something that's four years out versus two years out for your water supply plan. So are there outs, you know, that are written in the plan or, so that's, I'm just curious as to, the language has to be flexible enough to have enough caveats to say if something new comes along, then we have to, we can do this or something. And then tag along question is, how does that feedback in if there's going to be really water supply constraints to the regional development plan because we are going to hit some water supply constraints that are going to take longer to build out possibly or not be able to build out at all and how that fits with the development. So there's two loaded questions in there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, this, I appreciate that question very much. The 
recognizing that there will be some very specific work going on in different subregions across the metro has been part of our thinking as we are setting up this subregional approach. And I would invite Judy or anyone else up to here to, to add to this. But um, as we as we are, are approaching these subregional groups, uh, we are starting with some core teams in each of those areas to get their input on what would be the appropriate way to engage stakeholders in this area on that higher level water supply planning. And it's a 10 year plan, right. or it's a, it's a 30 year plan, but a 10 year cycle, right? So it's a longer term plan than some of the, the shorter term capital right. investment plans. So keeping aware, keeping aware of the scope and the, the timing mm -hmm. and when we might wanna do updates is important for how we approach this. Um, we have not yet reached out. We were kind of waiting to see Wait, what no, this no. north and east uh, would develop into, but conversations about how to do both of those and connect them appropriately are, are very much going to happen and on the, on the schedule to start doing that. Um, there are other parts of the Metro who have also kind of less obviously done some water supply work. So uh, we're looking for opportunities where there's interest and it's appropriate to partner with some existing groups like the Dakota County Source Water Protect Collaborative because um, there's a lot of engagement there. So how do we leverage what they're already doing and, and support what they're already doing? So when we meet with these core groups, I think that that'll start to become uh, more clear in terms of how do we want to scope our subregional piece and how can it augment any work that's already going on in those right. subregions? Well, thank you for reminding me that this is a 30-year plan and this is a four-year mm. thing. And mm -hmm. But there's got to be some language in there to say that you know, there could be a, a break or something that says, you know, there's the plan, but you might not be able to, there might be some change in the plan in that 30 years, so. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Council Member Cedarberg, that was the, the point. I'm Judy Svensek, manager of the Water Resources Group. Um, that was the point I was gonna make. While this plan, the schedules aren't exactly time and great, um, the policy plan and the uh, Metro Area Water Supply Plan will be done before the White Bear Lake project is over. We will have some information that we can glean from the White Bear Lake project that we can put into that plan. There's always the possibility of doing plan amendments. Okay, um, that's, that's what I was yeah. asking. So we can update things as they are, they are needed as well. Okay, yeah, that, okay, I was hoping, okay, plan amendments, that's perfect. So I was just thinking <laughs> that you get new data, something might change, plan amendments, <laughs> and then, okay, that's, thank you. Great question, other comments or questions? I know I've been thinking about water and equity issues, um, uh, like um, how communities have access to all communities and people within those communities have access to decision making, that everybody has access to safe, affordable <clears throat> water, um, that everybody shares in the economic benefits that water brings. Um, and that we have resilience in the face of floods and droughts. And, and I see on the topics that you're discussed that each one of those things could have an equity component to it. But I'm just curious if the group, MOSAC or MOSAC, I guess, not tech, more than TAC, maybe, um, has thought about that, or if you've thought, the two of you have thought about that. And I know I'll wrap up by saying, I know we have a tribal consultation coming up in about five or six weeks or so, in person and virtual. And so this perhaps could be a component of that conversation as well. Uh, yes, we have thought about equity and wrestled with it. Um, I. I think for those interested in this and, and exploring a lot of the different facets and factors that come into play with equity in water, um, we touched on uh, a little bit on that in the MOSAC report, just recognizing that water is critical to everybody. Everybody should have access to affordable water. But we have the 
space to explore that a little bit more in the policy research papers that ES mm -hmm. is working on right now and will be bringing, brought through our water advisory group and will be bringing to uh, Environment Committee. Moss Akintak have started reviewing those papers, thinking about them. Um, but they each do include some content about some of the equity considerations under the different topics. And so um, starting to explore that think about what that might mean is, is going to be part of the conversation over this coming summer in particular. I just was going to add, the only thing is that, so we'll be bringing this to you. We'll be looking for your input to add to that as well. Um, as Landon mentioned, we have really started the focus of that in these, in these white papers that we're working on, research papers, which will be out um, on our website available for the public to add input on as well. So we're trying to get all angles and avenues of getting input on how we can go further in these areas than we have in the past. So thank you. Great. And I, I know we're not the utility. I get that question when I'm out in the community <laughs> too. Like, oh, you're, you provide great drinking water. Well, that's not exactly us. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I know that there's a lot of money coming down the pike for uh, lead pipe replacement. And I don't know if there's a role for us to play in that, uh, in that space or not as a convener or information share or, or something greater, I, I'm not quite sure. Mr. Chair, so we, aren't, we weren't given the money to deal and address lead pipes, but we are certainly, we work as part of the interagency coordination team with the other state agency leaders. Um, and that is a topic that we talk about is where we're gonna go with some of these coordinated efforts on um, lead pipe replacements and other issues related to water. So we will have a role in that way. And if something comes up where they need us to play a bigger role, we will certainly be more willing to talk and work with them on that. So. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yeah, I was just curious, what is the percentage of uh, lead pipe uh, versus the total number of pipes that we have in the Twin Cities area? Is there a... I do not know that number off the top of my head, but I can find it for you. Um, it is, as a region, I do feel we're lucky because a lot of our development in water supply infrastructure investments were done after lead pipes were no longer being used. So a lot of our communities don't have a huge issue with lead pipes, but our, the older parts of our communities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, that is a significant issue. But because it's kind of city by city, it's hard to find that number, but I can find something. Yeah, because it seems like equity is built into that, you know, because of a lot of low income areas tend to be the older areas in yeah. cities. And so they would tend to have those problems. So. It equity kind of piggybacks onto that. Yes. Yeah. And St. Paul Water is rolling out a lead lead pipe replacement program, and um, you can go online, put in your address, and see if you qualify for the replacement. Um, I keep doing it, and my, my home's not on the list yet, but I keep refreshing. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's like trying to get Taylor Swift tickets or something. <laughs> now, that is a great resource for everybody in St. Paul. And mm -hmm. I will find the link to and share that with the group. Well, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you for Thank the you. time. And that brings us to our second information item, which is asset programs for condition assessment. Mr. Gordon, welcome. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you for having me. Uh, last year, I was invited to the uh, American Public Works Association Fall Conference to give a speech on uh, asset programs within our interceptor program. And so I fast forward, uh, start off this year, I was moved by a lot of the good questions that came from council members here, the committee members, when we presented three emergency declarations, there seemed to be a, a little bit of a want to know how do we manage these things internally and how do we address uh, 
our aging infrastructure. And so tonight I dusted off the uh, old presentation from last fall. A lot of it is very, very pertinent and wanted to share that with you today just to bring you up to speed a little bit with how we actually go through the business of um, looking at our conditions with our system, uh, particularly with the interceptor system. With that, I have some dated information because this is all from last year. You know, you're going to be reviewing pretty soon the uh, updated capital program. Um, but we go through the usual. I didn't take the slides out, but it talks about the wastewater system. So you know that we work with a very large and complex system. It, particularly the conveyance system is very complex and it's spatially spread out all over the place. The uh, MCS capital improvement program is mostly based on the conditions that we observe. So we had last year predicted 120 million investment over the next six years. Uh, so this represents about 37% of the capital improvement <coughs> program is in the interceptor system. And 60% of it was dressed, uh, addressed um, towards rehabilitation projects. And last year we had about 70 active projects. I just rolled up our latest list and we're up to 100 projects. And we're hopeful to get up to uh, a full 14 project managers this year. Um, a bit of a reach, but we're getting there. And of course the spend, you can see that you, you heard Ned discuss the uh, capital spend over the last uh, decade here, but we had up to about 2022 um, paying off a debt bubble. At the same time, we were looking at increases overall in the program with two new wastewater treatment plants that are scheduled mm -hmm. for the end of uh, by 2030 or earlier as well as a lot of more additional rehab that needs to take place in both the interceptor system and at the plants. So this is where the beef of the, uh, this presentation kind of starts, which is talking about the asset management systems that we've put into place within the interceptor system. And most people focus on two main components of an asset management, which is the calculation of risk and risk failure, which is the consequences of those failure and the likelihood of those failures. And if you take those things and you multiply them together, you come up with a scoring, and that's how we get projects added to the capital program. Uh, the consequences is a measurement that ranges from the manageable to basically the unmanageable. And I always like to use the example of when we blew out the uh, Blue Lake Siphon Headhouses way back in <laughs> 1987, I think it was, in a superstorm. That was unmanageable. Right. Uh, basically, we were mainlining sewage that would have gone into our wastewater treatment plant directly into the Minnesota River for about two weeks. Wow. So we don't, that's, that's unacceptable. We're not <laughs> proud of that. We tried to avoid that. Um, and then we talk about the likelihood of failure. And one of the things that's kind of baked in to the interceptor program is that we have something called the uh, NASCO PAPC system, which is a pipe rating system. And fortunately, it's based on scores of one to five, which is basically excellent to failing. So five is a failing pipe. And that's kind of the jargon you'll hear coming in a lot as either my assistants, uh, Tim Wedeen or Chris Remus come in, they'll, take about, they'll talk about, oh, this is a condition five pipe. Well, it's failing. Hmm. We don't like failing pipe in the system. We try to address condition five pipe whenever possible right away. Also, four is not all that great. It's poor <laughs> condition. And it's likely to turn into a five from what we can observe in our system fairly rapidly within five or 10 years. So 
we are also motivated to try to get all the condition four pipe out of our system. But of course, we need to have a way of going through and prioritizing all the pipe to make sure we take care of the, the worst pipe first. Oh, I should back up. Uh, so the other components that we talk about, I have to pride myself on this little funnel because this is how I think about it, is that it's not just about the risk calculation and prioritization, but what feeds into that. Mm. It's also the, con it, the condition assessments come together with that risk prioritization along with our level of service. The level of service, and you've probably seen that diagram before, but it includes things like meeting capacity needs. So if we can't meet capacity needs, one can think of that as the same sort of issue of working with a, maybe a manageable to unmanageable situation. Uh, so that also goes into the risk calculation. There's also issues like safety. If something is unsafe, then that presents a constant consequence that might not be really desirable, and we want to correct those issues too. Um, a good example is uh, we started a project this year to address electrical equipment at five different lift stations. Why? Because the electrical equipment is unsafe. It can't be uh, used without there being a certain level of safety, either for arc flash reasons. In other words, if there is a fault, it's going to be a traumatic fault. There's going to be a lot of energy release. Or there's going to be the risk that you know, the system will actually go down. So it really reduces our reliability. So those are other, con other things that play into our risk calculation and our consequences. So we look at the condition assessments, and you think about that 60% or greater. I have a feeling it's going to become greater over the years to come. Is currently driving about two-thirds of the capital program. If you're not doing condition assessments, you're not going to know what needs to be fixed. Condition assessments are something that are, is performed both by contractors, is performed internally, is performed by our operations staff, is performed by our maintenance staff. And one of the things we try to do is plan it out so that all the people within our organization know what they're supposed to be doing each year. And so we went, we stepped back away from what I would call traditional asset management planning and thought a little bit more about what it means to actually <coughs> yearly and programmatically conduct condition assessment planning. And the questions we asked is how much of this can be formed internally? How much of it is contracted? Who in the organization is responsible? When is it supposed to be completed? And where is the data stored and how is it shared? And who reports it out? And all the accessibility issues with the data and how it's updated. And so these are what I call, in previous life, I used to have to write business plans for getting work as a consultant. Or, and anybody who starts a business has a business plan, is kind of the business planning aspect of condition assessment. So we have plans in place that cover certain assets. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those going forward. So the first uh, plan that we came up with was for gravity interceptor pipe. Now, we've always used CCTV to go out and inspect gravity pipe. We've been doing it for probably the last 30 years. So that's not anything new, except all those other elements I just talked about, how the data is short, how it's stored, how it's reported out, uh, how much is being invested yearly. And the thing we discovered while going through the planning process is that we've had a lot of mountains and valleys <coughs> and how much data we've collected over the years. Um, with our CCTV assessment program. In addition, we've been always going out and doing list station uh, assessments. And those are really fun because you turn a consultant loose with a list of 
list stations and you say, provide us a condition assessment, and they give you a report for each one of them. It's kind of like having water supply on a, on a municipal basis rather than talking about regional water supply issues. Uh, so a lot of that information is very hard to digest, and it's really not in the language of asset management of trying to gauge the consequences and the conditions that are actually out there. They're, they're more wordy than that. Another area that we started planning for is and completed is pressure pipe. And I'm going to go over that in detail at the end of the uh, last half of this presentation. But as well as we have cathodic protection program. Uh, the cathodic protection program we uh, conduct internally. It's something, I'm, I'm using a word that you might not all understand, but when we put metal pipes in the ground, a lot of those are cathodically protected. In other words, there's an electrical circuit that actually protects the pipe. You have to make sure that electrical circuit works. And our electricians go out, they have been going out every year and measuring the data. The problem was we weren't doing anything with the data. <laughs> so now we have a plan where, okay, on this particular month, we're going to invite somebody back in to review that data. And then that data, you know, is reported back out as to what's bad, what needs to be corrected. So it's very <laughs> much having a plan on paper for how you're going to handle all of these things. Uh, the pressure pipe, which one of our most recent emergency decks was about, the pressure systems, uh, which includes siphons and forest mains and river crossings, they were never, a lot of them were never constructed so that we could inspect them. They're under pressure, and a lot of them are single barrel pipes. So that presents an issue if you want to inspect a pipe, you have to take the system down. Now, if you're a house plumber, that's great. You just tell the homeowner that you're going to shut off the pipe for or the water to the house for a little while, and you're going to go fix the plumbing, and you're done. And you go to the main shutoff valve, and it's right there, and things are easy. We can't shut off the pipe. We can't shut off the flow. So in some situations, we're having to set up temporary conveyance, or we're having to truck flow, or we're having to do things under pressure, which is not easy to do. Another area that we have a plan, and that's fully imp been implemented, and this is about the second year of it running, is the meter program. So our meters all have, t or what, we ha what have been doing is going through and, and what we call die testing, or making sure that those meters are reading accurately. And we've found meters that aren't me measuring accurately. And it's very <laughs> difficult, you have to have just the right kind of flow regime going through a meter for it to work properly. So there's all sorts of things that can interfere with that. Uh, we have one meter um, on the northern area that the city came by and they lined the pipe. So now there's actually a change in the depth of the pipe as it meets the meter, and that's thrown off the readings on the meter. So that's something we have to correct. Um, there are other meters that we have had to work with very closely to try to figure out what's the issue here, why isn't it reading right, and it's taken either temporary metering or uh, more than one die test to figure out what's going on. Uh, as well as there's issues, it's, it's an open flow channel of sewage, so in a lot of these we have a lot of corrosion from H2S buildup, as well as it becomes a safety hazard because one of the things we like to do is go down into the meter and it's jargon, stick it, you put a ruler in the flow, and you report back what the depth of the flow is so that people who are running the instruments and, and seeing the readout can actually verify that that's what the meter the meter's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So there is a lot of manned entry into these and a lot of potential contact. So we're concerned about safety with these uh, vaults. Um, and a lot of them are in roadways and other places that present all sorts of hazards. We have an odor control program. So we have many odor control locations around the cities. 
we feed in bioxide, we treat air with carbon, or we have uh, in one site a biotrickling filter, we have uh, many different bioreactors all aimed at trying to curb uh, the odor and also the corrosion that's resultant of the H2S in the pipe. There is a person there smelling out of a machine that's called an olfactometer, which is kind of a neat little picture. Uh, that's actually how we measure a lot of our odors within the system. Our human nose is very, very sensitive to a lot of the oh, odors geez. in the system. And so they dilute the sample, and you can actually get a pretty good qualitative idea of what you're dealing with. Commissioner Carter would like to yeah, uh, volunteer I, I, for that. Well, you know, I wouldn't <laughs> mind, actually. Um, I thought it was a mechanical nose, but then I saw her actually putting her nose in there, and I thought, that's interesting. That, yes. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind having a tour there. So <laughs> it actually, it's very interesting to me. We have a flow control program. So there's many places in the system, especially in our pressure pipe uh, systems, where we have valves, we have weirs, uh, we have one place where we have orifice places. There is actually a hole in a plate, and it controls the amount of flow that goes through. The, the, one of the frustrating things as an engineer is that we like to put valves everywhere because the more valves, the more flexibility. And then I realize that, uh oh, we just built a rat nest of valves, and sewage <laughs> valves don't work like you hope they work. Um, they have a tendency to get pretty gummed up and they don't function too well if they're not exercised. And we have to be very careful about how many valves we put in the system with any new project because we want to make sure that's manageable and that we can exercise the valves. So there is a flow control program that we've developed where we actually talk about how many valves do we need to exercise and when and where are they located so we can come up with that plan. This is a very interesting, another program that we started up. We got into that, we did one program and then it just blossomed. And I don't even get too involved with how many programs are getting developed right now. We just have different staff that say, you know, we need another program. Well, another great area where we have issues with risk is in our sandstone tunnel program. And those two gentlemen who are standing on top of the green, near the green pipe, they're actually standing on top of the interceptor. Hmm. So what you find is that in sandstone, there's a natural tendency for erosion to occur from seepage of groundwater through the sandstone, and it erodes the area out above the pipe. And it'll actually keep going up to the sandstone until it hits like a shale layer or something else, and then it'll stop. But the cavern that opens up can be immense. Hmm. And we fear that some of the chunks that come off the walls of this cavern could actually come down and break the pipe. Mm -hmm. So this is in 4th Street in Minneapolis. We went through, cleared out all the sand, and replaced it with a flowable, cementuous material so that we stopped that cavern activity from forming. Um, to get above the pipe, in a lot of places, you can imagine that's difficult as well. And so we have a program where we're looking at all the sandstone tunnels in the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul and going through the ones that we suspect are at higher risk first. And mm -hmm. we'll hopefully in the next 10 years get through all of them and inspect just what kind of mischief is happening above our pipes. So that leads us to this second half. I hope I'm not carrying on too much, um, but our condition assessment program for pressure pipe, like I said, is one that's taken a lot of work to put together. It's now in place, and we are currently in this year's capital program tackling four force main siphons uh, across the region. We have to actually temporarily convey flow uh, and then we can launch both camera and other instruments into the pipe and look at um, thicknesses of pipes 
and what kind of corrosion we have. Uh, you either have temporary conveyance, in one case where we had the benefit of diverting flow into another gravity interceptor. Hmm. To start off that program, we had to first inventory everything that was out there, and as you can see, it's pretty widespread. Quite a bit of green on the west side of town around Lake Minnetonka because that's the was deemed the most economical way to get flow, uh, wastewater, from all those communities around the lake. And we, as well as we have some forest mains to the north, there's a lot of uh, blue on there, which I believe is the siphons and outfalls. Uh, so there's different pressure pipes throughout the whole system. We went through and inventoried them all in our GIS system. Mm -hmm. And then we took a look at what kind of pipe is it. We not only looked at what kind of pipe it is, but when was it put in, what kind of soils they were put in, and so we could better formulate a, a risk calculation, actually, a kind of a what-if sort of calculation so we could better prioritize what we should inspect first, because not too many pressure pipes have been inspected before this. We have inspected uh, the Lake Street Siphon a couple times. It used to be routinely walked, um, but we had a rather large construction project to inspect that pipe just a couple years ago. But not too much has been paid to a lot of the remaining pipe in the system. So we looked at the pipe types and that gives us a pretty good clue right away because there are corrodible pipes, and I'll call them uncorrodible pipes. So your plastic pipes, which are the fiberglass reinforced mortar pipes, the high density pipe, HDPE, and the PVC pipe. Those are good pipes for force mains because they don't corrode. Uh, the cast iron pipes, ductile iron pipes, and uh, the concrete pipes, and they actually use concrete pipe for pressure pipe. Those are corrodible, so we were very concerned about those and want to make sure that we hit up those first in our inspections. So we looked at all the miles of uh, pipe that we've inspected, um, but unfortunately there is about 66% of it that we haven't inspected. We turned around and looked at, well, if we were to uh, look at the current condition ratings and we didn't have too much condition ratings for existing pipe because we don't have, we haven't conducted a lot of inspections in the previous 20 years. And we looked at, well, how often should this be inspected? And this is typical with all the project or the program manuals is we, well, how often do you look at it? And we decided that if it's corrodible pipe, it really should be inspected every 10 years. Otherwise, we all inspect it every 15 years. And if it's in bad shape, we'll keep an eye on it shorter, like every five years. Uh, this is exactly the same uh, inspection schedules we use for gravity pipe. And if we want to get out there and do everything that we want to do, we'd have a heck of a lot of work in one year, um, which wasn't going to be economical, nor did we have the manpower, nor did anybody have enough consulting uh, uh, contract capacity to go out and look at everything all at once. It wasn't going to happen. So then we planned it out where we evened it all out over the next 10 years that we'd catch up to where we should be with inspection of all this pipe. So this is also another crucial part of the plan is how are you going to tackle this over the next 10 years. And then make sure that we understood the prioritization so for pressure pipe, we have a list of consequences that define something that's negligible all the way up to severe, as well as what kind of pipe conditions you have that uh, are like new all the way up to it's failing. Wow. And this is more a what if. This isn't the actual prioritization the, that we don't have our condition results back for a lot of pipe yet. So we'll apply something very similar when we score things to enter the capital program. And this is the heart. I like these diagrams. Everybody was a little bit resistant to putting this together, but it's a swim lane diagram. And internally, for managing our operations group, our maintenance group, our capital program, and our consultants and our GIS folks, as well as 
anybody else that gets involved with one of these programs. It tells you exactly what to do and when. And that, to me, as a manager, that's, that's what I needed. I needed people to tell me when. Um, and I needed, and the other thing that's really nice about this is not one person that's in charge of this, it's a group effort. And one of the things I like is that when it comes to putting together a capital program, I actually don't, I don't tell anybody what should be in the capital program. It comes from staff up. So it comes from our operators, it comes from our engineers, it comes from our maintenance people. And that's really important because that's where the data is. So I have a short thing in here in conclusions. And this is for all of our interceptors, not just pressure pipe. But one of the things I wanted to show the APWA members was how a lot of our pipe, you can see the 37% in there, is pretty old. It was constructed between 1961 and 1980. Our mm -hmm. pipe materials, we still have a lot of corrodible materials that are in the system. We have uh, a fairly, you know, the small sliver is the Condition 5 pipe, which went into the program this year. The part that bugs me here is that we still have a lot of Condition 4 pipe, although it's not the biggest slice of the pie, but it's still there and we need to get ahead of it. And then people always ask, well, how are you progressing along? And I, it's, this took a little bit of gyration with GIS, but I managed to work it out with uh, some dedicated time from our GIS staff, so I'm very appreciative of that. But we have been progressing. So ever since the, uh, the 1990s, we've been pretty active in, in uh, cured-in-place pipe rehabilitation and other lining pipe, as well as replacement. And we're gradually um, getting on top of the item, uh, but also our system is growing there. So you can see that we've added some miles of pipe over the years. And with that, I'm sure you have lots of questions. But Just on that last helps. slide, <clears throat> at the rate that we are doing cured in place or re total replacement, when would we get rid of corrodible pipe? When would we have no more corrodible pipe? <clears throat> 10 years, 30 years, 50 years? It'll be ballpark. better than 10. Yeah, <laughs> I figured. It'll be, it'll be for some time to come. And you know, the thing is, is I, I always like to point out that there are sections of our 1MN 330s sewer that was constructed in 1930s. It looks fabulous. Really? There are some concrete pipes that are near the end of discharges for force mains and they're exposed to high H2S and they're gone in 10 years. So. Mm. It's really, and that's something that we haven't done in the programs, but I feel that's something that we can progress towards over the next decade here is better understanding, you know, heat maps of our H2S. We've talked about that and how we're collecting the data that could go into that. But just looking at what areas are really sub subject to the extreme conditions. Um, and other communities are doing that as well. So I, I think that's a helpful too as well. But nothing, in this case, we, we have a strong component and a strong backbone and already um, doing CCTV of our gravity interceptors. We've always been doing it. If we can keep on it with uh, a 10 year inspection cycle, then I think we're gonna be in great shape for making sure we keep up with it. Agreed. Questions, comments, please. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, one word can't stuck with me is data. So, with all the programs, um, what's your infrastructure for keeping, expanding, keeping track of your data so it's easily retrievable? Like, I know you made a couple comments early on, like, there's all this data, but we're not using it, or the reports aren't coming in, not the way you want to. So, it seems like there's got to be a program to have a very robust data management retrieval so anybody can call stuff up that they want, like, quickly. Right. Could you Count, speak to yeah. that? Uh, Mr. Chair, council members, that could go and I could keep you here 
I could keep here Just for hours if I wanted to, <laughs> but one of the things that's been done in parallel with the programs is developing dashboards in our GIS system for each of the programs. Perfect. Uh, we're adding them, it's a continuous process, but right now you can go on to our mapping app, which everybody staff-wise has access to, so anybody can look and see what conditions they have in the both the pipe as well as there's dashboards for uh, structures for odor control, um, so you name it, it's the information is there, and it's at the hands of any any of our staff. There is no limits. It's just a big project all on its own. Yes. So mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Great report. Great report. Thank you very great. much. Appreciate it. Good detail. <laughs> and with that, that takes us to our general manager's report. I can't help myself the comment on the system you just heard about. Very complex. And all mm. those pipes have personalities based on mm -hmm. you know where they are, what's flowing through them, and all the different conditions. So it does get to be a lot of parts of a whole that all have to be looked at you know, based on their characteristics. So staff's doing a great job looking at how to frame that up so that we can be ahead of those different personalities of those pipes as best we can, and they're using technology. So I think that uh, we're in a much better place mm. than we were not too many years ago, and the direction we're headed in is going to get us even better and better as we go forward. But it is a challenge, a lot of moving parts, and it takes a lot of teamwork to get, to get the system to perform as we want it to, right, mm -hmm. reliably. And with that, I'll talk about our plants, same kind of a challenge. Um, the next uh, Environment Committee meeting, July 11th, I won't be here. Someone will be standing in for me, and I will be at the National Association of Clean Water Agencies Summer Conference. And that's the conference in which they hand out their awards to utilities for high performance. And uh, Wendy and... And Peter know that I've talked about this every year. It's our pride and joy that our plants have such a good compliance record going. And the association has a platinum category. So if you've been five or more years of perfect compliance or 100% compliance, then you get an award for that. And seven of our facilities will be receiving that award at this conference. And one of our facilities is at 32 years, that's Hastings, and there's only a couple other facilities in the country that are better than that. So um, we're particularly proud of Hastings, and then St. Croix is 31 years, so they're right behind. And we have Blue Lake and Eagles Point at 17 years, and we have Empire at 15 years, Metro at 11, and Seneca at six. And our other two facilities don't, don't have a five-year record going. Rogers hasn't been with us that long. And East Bethel is just approaching that where they could end up in the platinum too. But they had perfect compliance, but not yet to that five years or more. So every, every year we uh, take those accomplishments and we make sure we let all the staff celebrate that accomplishment and take time to think about what were the challenges in making some of those difficult days. Maybe it's equipment down, maybe it's a lot of illnesses, you know, it's the weather, it's what came down that you didn't expect, you know, came down the pipe or when it came down. So there's a lot of things that uh, can make daily challenges and it takes a team to pull it, pull it off when those things happen, so. That's what I, will I just want add to report on tonight. <clears throat> 32 years for Hastings, and uh, I just want to thank the folks at the Hastings plant that really went through uh, Yeoman's efforts um, during challenging times in the last month or two uh, to keep that wastewater as clean, to get it as clean as it possibly can. Um, and also, we had a really good uh, uh, customer uh, service, uh, customer forum. Um, maybe three weeks ago now, two, three weeks ago, uh, in person. Um, our virtual one, I think there must have been 50-plus 50, 50 people that attended that, maybe more. 
Um, we had smaller uh, turnout for the in-person, um, maybe shot just shy of 10 or so, but a uh, good robust conversation and uh, our customers seem pretty pleased with what we're up to. Ned's, thingy, Ned's is Ned here? here? He is. Ned he did a great job. <laughs> How many people had that virtual meeting? A little over 50. A little over 50. Oh, okay. Good. Good, good. Yeah, and all the staff did a great job at, at those two events. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.